We can start it. Anna, are you, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining on a Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. Uh, great to have everybody here. Uh, excited to have another talk with Anna today um, on error mitigation and error correction in quantum computing. Cool. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if people, if you've been before, uh, but Anna has been around before, but, uh, if you guys don't know her, she did go to University of California, Davis, um, got a master's degree in physics, pretty solid. Um, are you, yeah. So you also have a medical degree as well. I do. So, yeah. He's a MD. MD that was well. a, kind of a detour. Yeah. That is a very big detour. Um, but yeah, also got an MD in medicine. Um, but graduate degree at the University of California with an emphasis on quantum theory um, and has been lecturing and teaching quantum topics for the past four years. Um, currently, she is developing quantum algorithms and quantum software based in Chicago still, right? Yep. Yep. Cool. So uh, Jennifer has talked today and we'll probably go into more detail. Um, but pretty much the nature of errors, practical model of errors, error mitigation, error correction with qubits, and some experimental results um, with the pair experiment magic square game. Um, so yeah, uh, just one more time. Uh, and Nathan, uh, yeah, good to credit you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. Um, so my presence on the internet has been Quantum Computing with Anna. That's the meetup group and the YouTube channel. But uh, with some friends, I launched a corporation, the Quantum Physics Corporation. And the YouTube channel has been re given that name. It's a nonprofit. So I can't really uh, use the corporate uh, money to pay for a channel that's named after me. It has to be named after the corporation. So uh, yeah, I had quite a challenge preparing for this event and uh, didn't get to the finish line. I, I think I have a lot of good material uh, that will address people at various levels uh, of expertise. Uh, but not the finish line. Anyway, let's get started. I'll share my screen now. Error correction in quantum computers. So here's our agenda for tonight. Level setting, this will be background information on quantum computing. And uh, I didn't prepare, a, uh, I, I don't have a lesson plan for, for this section. And it's gonna be kind of elastic, basically. If there are questions, because I don't have material for uh, the full two hours, there's plenty of time for, for questions and answers at the beginning, particularly for those of us who maybe need to uh, need background on quantum computing. Then I'll go into the technical details, problem of noise and errors, the difference between error correction and error mitigation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the universal gate set um, this is, well, if you look at a, a Turing machine is a, is a universal computer for classical communication, right? Any algorithm, it's thought, and this is the Church-Turing hypothesis, any algorithm can be implemented as a Turing machine. Likewise, in quantum computing, you have the analogous result that... Uh, any quantum program, any quantum circuit can be expressed as a sequence of gates drawn from a very small set, the universal gate set. 
Now, the, uh, the original error correction schemes don't work on all those gates. They only work on a subset called the Clifford gate set. And uh, so I'm going to distinguish between those two and talk about how we can try to extend error correction to the universal gate set. Then there will be question and answers at the end of the discussion. So here's the level setting uh, section of the talk. If, if you are a beginner or have questions, well, I have questions myself, um, but if you uh, want to fill in your background, this time is reserved for you. And I've uh, prepared a, a series of questions. These are like prompts, basically. Uh, uh, these are questions that I suggest, but uh, I invite you to pose your own questions. And so, um, Helen, can people unmute themselves and ask questions? Do they have the privilege of unmuting? Yes, yes. Okay, well, I'll throw the floor open for comments, uh, such as the ones that are on the screen, or questions such as the ones that are on the screen, or, or any others you might have. I like the set of questions you've come up with, Anna. These are, it cuts across a lot of different areas. It's a, a good set, I think. Thank you. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, I, no one's going to hop in there. Uh, I'd be pretty curious uh, to hear your answer on uh, why are tra ion computers superior to transmont? But what are transmont? Is that just like the regular ones? So I'd be interested in that question. Transpon, transmonds are based on superconducting Josephson junctions. And IBM has uh, is the uh, far and away the leader in transmond based devices. Okay. And uh, uh, the qubits are not identical to one another. Each one is manufactured within a certain tolerance. And uh, a transmond quantum computer is easier to build than a trapped ion machine. And there are a lot more of them out there. IBM has dozens. I don't even know how many, maybe a hundred, maybe more. Uh, they're easier to build. Um, the difficulty is they're laid out like, uh, like on a very large scale integrated circuit chip. So you have the transponds, and you have microwave uh, resonators and waveguides connecting them. Well, if you think about it, if you have four uh, qubits on a chip and you try to draw a connection, say a waveguide from one to another for, for all 24 combinations, all, all, all uh, six pairs, then they'd have to cross one another. That's just geometry. And so that's the difficulty is on an IBM quantum computer, uh, qubit five can't interact with qubit two necessarily, for example. Uh, you have to move, you have to teleport qubit two to qubit four so that it's physically adjacent to qubit five then they can interact like with a controlled knot. So it's it's basically topology. That's one of the main difficulties with the transmond devices. The second difficulty, which I alluded to a moment ago, is they're not identical. Each one is manufactured to specific tolerances and the control electronics for each one may be different. And so, um, the fidelity isn't as good. When I ran the Paris Merman magic squares algorithm, I got like 60% correct answers out of the uh, publicly available IBM device. I upgraded to the Falcon processor with 24 qubits and I got 80% accuracy. But when I 
switch to the continuum trapped ion machine, which you can get free time on through Microsoft. Uh, I got 97% accuracy. So I'm a believer in trapped ions. Now there are other technologies which uh, I don't know much about, but there are new players besides transmons and trapped ions. Does that so, help? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so pretty much uh, better accuracy and result due to the topology of the system, right? Yep. Um, and uh, it's just easier for the qubits to interact with each other uh, in a trapped ion versus like, like it sounds like the qubits just like a line or something. So like it's harder for like qubit one to interact with qubit five because like all the way over there um, and has to like cross all the other ones. Right, um, with a trapped ion machine, you have an RF trap of, uh, I believe it's called a Paul trap, which moves the ions around so that if you need qubit one to interact with qubit five, they have what's called a carousel that moves them, brings them into proximity. They undergo a mechanical vibration, an oscillation like this. Right. And this produces a, a gate that can be used for control of that. And then my follow-up question to that is, um, uh, so I'm based in Toronto, so uh, Xanadu, is that a trapped ion quantum computer? I don't think it is. I think it's one of these newer technologies that I alluded to that I uh, still am learning about. True. How about like Rigetti? Rigetti is, uh, I believe it's Transmon. Yeah, Rigetti is Transmon, and then Xanadu is Photonics. Photonics, oh, right. And photonic quantum computers are quite different from these others. Uh, I'm not sure they'll execute a general circuit. I, I think they're like for sampling problems and other uh, more uh, uh, a narrower set of use cases. Right, Kevin? Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, as far as I know, I mean, the, the top two are trapped ion and then gate-based superconducting or transmon. So it's going to take a while. There was a big thing for spin qubits, the potential for billions of qubits. But if you look at the paper, it's kind of very technical, and it might be some time off um, as sure. far as today's KISS kit and then ticket, you know, INQ. Um, so that's the way it seems. There's also the uh, neutral atom. Uh, qubits that uh, I believe are have a ton of perf uh, pro potential just based on how they're isolated and how they can be um, arranged in three-dimensional arrays quite easily. It's just a matter of figuring out all the laser angles. And that, that's also a technology where the qubits can be moved around so that any two qubits can be brought in proximity of, each, of one or another so that they can interact. Yep, and uh, one of the scientists from, I believe it was Atom Computing, gave a presentation uh, at Quantum Computing with Anna. I recorded it. It's on my YouTube channel, which has also been renamed and is now called the Quantum Physics Corporation. So if you go there, you can learn all about this technology. Yeah, I highly recommend uh, watching that video. I, I haven't heard much from them lately, but... Uh, uh, it, it seems to me it has a ton of potential. Um, also, there was some talk about the uh, the uh, trapped ions, and uh, Anna mentioned that they use a carousel mechanism. It was my understanding it's a set of carousels. Yes. So they have. So you can. I I kind of thought of it as a uh, a two dimensional Rubik's cube. So you have the ability to uh, move around on your carousel, but I think he also mentioned the, uh, that they can swap positions on the carousel. So you can bring any two qubits next to each other. You just have to uh, keep a, a puzzle map in memory somewhere to know how to rotate the, rotate the carousels and, uh, do, and at what points you can do the swaps. That's true, and it's all under the control of a field programmable gate array. 
Right. My understanding was with even with the other the transmon machines, you could in theory move any state from one spot location to another, but it takes too long. And eventually the decoherence time interferes with the gate fidelity. And so you can't um, reliably recreate and you lose a little bit of fidelity on each move. Is yeah. that similar? Do you know if that's similar with the um, the carousel mechanism? Is there a, the, problem? No, Is the, a cost for moving? Yeah, IBM uses what they called a, a folded hex grid. So every every qubit is only able to directly inter uh, interface with, uh, in some cases only two, and in other cases three, uh, other right. qubits. I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with that topology. What I'm wondering is on the carousel system, it, you said you could move the the bits. Is there a a fidelity yeah, cost or a decoherence yeah. time involved? Tra 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 uh, trapped ions have much much higher. Uh, um, uh life life to live time what's the word for that i'm i'm coherence. coherence they have much higher coherence than they're talking about approaching several seconds of coherence oh, that's, a, of that's a mil enormous yeah. improvement over yeah. the ibm stuff with the transmon devices the way they move the qubits around is teleportation and it involves a series of gate operations and measurements I think that kind of like went nicely. Uh, and I do want to, if you want to answer another one, but that kind of went nicely into what is decoherence? Oh, I have a slide for that. Oh, okay. uh, decoherence is where you have a quantum state and it becomes classical. So this is, a, uh, I made this by integrating Schrodinger's equation for a particle in a box. And, uh, Here's the quantum state evolving in time. And it's a little hard to see this here, but all of these positions are on the surface of the sphere. And that's called a pure state. In decoherence, they move into the, the quantum state moves into the interior of the sphere. So for instance, if you have a purely random classical state, if you have 100% decoherence, then you're sitting at the origin here in the center of the sphere. So it's basically uh, a loss of phase, a loss of the quantum information. Cool. Did anyone, have, did anyone else have any questions? I'll just, I'll, throw, I'll yeah. throw a big one out there. Uh, what, uh, what do, what uh, has to happen in quantum physics, uh, quantum mechanics, to make a big breakthrough in qubit technology? <laughs> You're going to keep me awake at night with that question. I, I, I mean, Ron, the real challenge is that these qubits have to be isolated from the environment. They have to be protected. So they, they have to be insensitive. But then when it comes time to do an operation, suddenly you've got to interact with them. You have to drop your shields and allow it to be influenced by its neighbors and by its environment. So you have conflicting engineering requirements. And, and that's, the real, uh, that's the real engineering challenge with quantum computers is these conflicting requirements. Um, of course, we also need more qubits uh, better decoherence time. Well, I I think that's the the key. If 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 this answers your question, uh, the conflicting requirements between isolation on the one hand and control on the other. Did I, did I answer your question, Ron? Um, I I think that stated the problem. You know, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, if some new piece of uh, a new revelation in quantum mechanics popped up. I don't know what it would be. Uh, I I just don't know enough about the actual quantum mechanics. But 
if, if some new revelation popped out of you know the research that's like going on at CERN or the peop the people who are tracing you know chasing after uh, uh, you know subatomic particles still yeah uh, if what if they find something that says oh oh my god this is gonna fix qubits. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the approach these days is there's an HBC wire paper and it basically says IBM might be looking more towards using dynamic decoupling as opposed to shooting for a million qubits and just running off of, you know, fragments of quantum computers. There's a recent paper I'm putting in the chat here. It's uh, Strange Works in Deloitte, and they didn't find that decoupling helped in this case. Um, but basically that software approach, because the physics, you know, it, it may take some time. Uh, I think if you had, uh, if you could develop the optical lattice technology where you could have multiple la lasers and have the waves interfering with one another so that you could create localized traps and have qubits at those positions, then maybe you could manipulate the qubits a little better. You turn the lasers off and they'd be isolated. You turn the lasers on and they would be uh, controllable. This is, I'm a theoretician. I don't know if you could build this in a laboratory. And unfortunately, I'm not funded to do experiments in my apartment. That was cool. It's a government initiative. So last week I presented on this and literally NIST and well, NSF is more like public funding, but in all these, there's so much government work that's occurred even before, you know, we heard about INQ getting big and Rigetti and uh, IBM, you know, it's just, it's, it's a government initiative, 100%. So I would check with them. <laughs> okay, well, now we'll get on to the meat of the presentation. First thing I want to talk about is, I thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, we're going to talk about the difference between error correction and error mitigation. And I had originally thought I would talk about both, but I'm kind of disenchanted with error mitigation. What error mitigation is, is say, for example, in a transmon device, you have these microwave amplifiers, very high gain amplifiers, and the gain drifts. It, it's not constant in time. And so the the fidelity is degraded as time goes on. So they may calibrate, IBM may calibrate their machine in the morning and an hour later, the amplifiers have drifted. So what you do is you run a lot of uh, benchmark circuits and analyze the errors you get. You know what you should get and you compare it to what you do get and infer the operating characteristics of the hardware. You create a model for the errors. And then when it comes time to run the actual circuit you're interested in, you try to apply the inverse transformation and undo those errors. I'm not impressed with it. I mean, for one thing, you've got to run a lot of uh, trials to get the error model. Uh, for another thing, an hour later, the error model might be wrong. So I decided not to really pursue error mitigation tonight. Uh, I, I think it's a poor cousin to error correction. Error correction, unlike error mitigation, requires only one trial. You run the circuit you're interested in, the program you're interested in, errors are detected and corrected at the time they occur. So it works on a single trial. Uh, does that make sense? Are there any questions or comments? So to detect them, you have to measure them. I don't think so. Uh, I didn't see any reference to measurement. I, I had that question too. Uh, uh, how do you do, how do you know if you, you're you have a qubit with an error if you don't measure it? Typically, what you're doing is you're using the bits and you look at what the results for the bits are. You use the same operations on the original state bits and the bits. By watching the bits, you can tell if something has happened to the uh, the actual state bits that you're interested in protecting. 
Well, Ken, do you measure the insula bits? So you don't have to do direct measurements upon it. There are ways to use that as a, um, you use the insula bit to do a controlled knot on another bit. That doesn't actually have to um, measure the original, the insula bit. So end up, what ends up happening though, is you have to have lots of bits, qubits available, not bits, qubits available. Um, and eventually you have indicator bits that will tell, will um, let you see if there's something dis in disagreement between the insula bits and the protected state bits. So rather than performing a measurement, you do a controlled knot, is that right? Yes. Great. Thank you for setting that up. So you're just talking about extra qubits that are brought along with, with the main algorithm. Yes, the yes. paper I looked at uh, had seven ancilla qubits for one uh, logical qubit. Okay. So here are our quantum errors again. Uh, it Excuse looks me. like the state kind of got lost at this point. Yeah, and real quick, uh, Barry Budd asked a question. He said, a physicist told me that during decoherence, some of the qubits snapped to either zero or one. He didn't say anything about impure states. Was he misleading me? Well, could you read that again, please? Yeah, he asked... Um, a physicist told me that during decoherence, some of the qubits snapped to either zero or one. He didn't say anything about impure states. Was he misleading me? I think he misspoke. I think decoherence gives you an impure state. Does anyone else have any input on that? Well, I think decoherence could be both, both options. If you affect a qubit enough, you could force it to the classical states, right? Um, but in your case, it's yours is a more sensitive um, interpretation of the uh, situation, Anna. There's more possible ways to screw up the quantum information than just snapping it to zero or one. Yeah, you could. Uh, so it's both, as as in as with quantum, a qubit, it's both answers. <laughs> <laughs> So what's what's the difference between an impure state and an entangled state? Quite a big difference. An impure state is below the surface of the block sphere. It's on the interior. The uh, length of the vector isn't one anymore. It's less than one. Yep. Which is, I believe, the trace of the density matrix. Whereas an entangled state, entanglement, of course, involves a pair of qubits, not just one, whereas decoherence can affect one qubit, but also an entangled state is a, is a pure state, uh, generally speaking. Okay, thank and you. I actually got a book open that's going to tell me about that when I read it after this uh, meeting. Thank you. And that, that would be the same for uh, superposition then too, right? In general, the superposition is a pure state, but you can have an impure state that is a mixture of super, of various superpositions. Impure states live in a, a different space than pure states. A pure state is a, a vector of complex numbers. An, an impure state is represented by a density matrix, which is a, uh, uh, two dimensional. It's not a vector. Oh, and with the pure state, the length of the vector has to be one. But the the um, the modulus, the square root of the sum of the squares of the two parameters of the the two states that you're comparing, the two base states, must right. sum to one. So that's the pure state. But if you scramble it enough, it could snap to a zero or a one completely. You lose the where you are on the surface of the sphere and it just goes to the poles. But it's also, if it's inside the sphere, 
then it's no longer a pure state because it's no longer the, the, the length of that vector is no longer one. I'm really glad you're with us tonight, Ken. I read a lot of papers lately. Yeah, apparently so. So we never represent that mixed state by describing a vector whose length is less than one? We describe well, it by a matrix whose trace, the, the trace of the square of the matrix is less than one. And I'm only talking about one qubit. When you have entangled qubits or more qubits in the system, it you can't represent it by a sphere anymore. Um, the sphere is only useful for representing one qubit, okay? And you can't just put two spheres next to each other because you're talking about something where it's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one are all valid uh, poles, right? And you have something where the, the length of that state vector, you, you if it's pure, the length of the state vector is still one. It has to be somewhere on that sphere. It's just that it's very odd shape. It's no longer a, a sphere. Right. If you have two qubits, the two spheres are entangled, and you can't, or the two qubits are entangled, and you, you can't, can be entangled. And if they are, then you can't represent the two qubit state by simply putting up a pair of spheres. Sorry. So, in that picture right there on the slide, um, is this qubit in an impure state? because it looks like the vector is less than one? I, I think it's in a pure state because I, I didn't just simulate measurement. I only simulated Schrodinger's equation. It just, it's an illusion of perspective. It looks like it's on the interior, but it's actually like on the backside or something. It's on, okay, like it's on the surface of the sphere, right? Yeah. Okay. And because the, uh, the vector moved around all along the surface of the sphere. Um, it was in a pure state the whole time because the vector was always uh, one while it was doing its thing. Yep. Okay. So, uh, okay, sounds good. So is there an understanding uh, what the actual physical characteristics of a qubit is when it's in an impure state? Yes, but understanding uh, basically in terms of a mathematical model, it's represented by a density matrix. And in particular, it's a sum, it's analogous to an ensemble. So if I have a mixed state, uh, say a mixture of zero, zero, and one, one, then uh, it's analogous to having like a thousand or a million quantum systems, uh, some of half of which are in zero, zero, and half of which are in one, one. So it's basically, it's more about the information that's available and, and less about the physical state of the system. Uh, uh, I, I feel my answer is in some sense inadequate, but it's the best I have. Well, uh, let me see if I can uh, clarify a, a qubit that's in the zero state, the physical, the physical characteristics of that qubit is a, to simplify it is at a specific or a minimum energy level, right? It's and at the again, lowest it, energy. Pardon? It's at the lowest, it's in the ground state, the lowest energy level. Right. So when it's in the one state, it's 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 at its physical characteristic is that it's a higher energy level. Yep. So, so are, are are there are there similar mappings to states that are unknown or impure or um otherwise not useful, I guess, at the moment? I think... Uh... So when two atoms come near each other, their, their energy states hybridize. So if you have two qubits that come approach to each other, you don't have 
if you're talking about just energy states, <clears throat> the zero and the one split, and you now get different, more energy options um, for the electron in this particular case, right? So it's kind of similar here, where instead of having just two states possible, there are multiple states, but what happens, happens is they split and separate. So it kind of becomes blurred. Um, the same thing happens- Blurring is a good metaphor for this. The, the hyperfine splitting of hydrogen. There's actually, there's a ground state for hydrogen, but there's actually four different energy levels down in the ground state, but they differ by such slight amounts um, that normally if you're talking about it, it's just zero. It's just the lowest energy state. But what happens is the quantum particles interact, the, the state ends up hybridizing and it blurs. So you get multiple energy levels possible. And I think that's, if you're talking about the physical and that, I think with your question, there's probably different answers if you're talking to the engineer who's trying to look at the qubit versus a theoretician who's trying to look at the linear equations describing the states versus someone who's trying to design the quantum computer and figure out which way the algorithm should work. So I, I'm hoping that that helps a little bit. I think it helps. Uh, yes, I mean, when you say Larry, blur, when you, when you say blurring, you're talking about <laughs> just not knowing which state it's in or it's it's at it's randomly moving back and forth between states. I think well, there's more than just the two states available that we think of at that point, right? It's not just right. one or the other. You get more states possible, but we don't necessarily know what the influence is of the environment. So that's why um, those states are less certain than they were before. That's part of what you're saying. What does it mean when it comes off the surface of the sphere and, sphere and moves in inside the sphere? because we don't know what the actual influence of the environment was. I think I can offer a physical picture that may be helpful. Um, you may have read about the stern gerlach apparatus where you have an oven and it's emitting charged ions or ions with non-zero spin. You put them in a magnetic field and they separate in and go in two directions. Well, when those atoms or those ions uh, come off of the oven, uh, their spin is not fixed. And, and so they're in an impure state. Then when you run them through a magnetic field, a non-uniform magnetic field, and they split into two trajectories, then in each of the two output ports, you have a pure state. Does that help? Yeah, either way, I think we're just going to move on. Barry had a question, though, before we move on. But Yeah, so I'm hearing zero for low energy and one for high energy or higher energy or whatever within. But is that always, that's not always the case. In If we're talking about electron spin, then it's not really a difference of energy. It's a difference of spin direction. Or if we're talking about photon polarization, it's a difference between vertically polarized or horizontally polarized with respect to the measurement device. So that's not an energy one or zero up or down, is it? Right. The, the two spin states are degenerate. They both have the same energy unless you apply a magnetic field that splits the energy levels. Okay, so this so the idea that we're, when I think of bits, of course, voltages, it's like something like below three volts is zero and above, or below two is zero and above three is one. But we're not talking about that always with qubits, right? No, we're not. They're discrete for one thing. Sure. And it's just a matter of convention. You could, you could define zero as, say you had a trapped ion with electrons orbiting the nuclei, you could, uh, you could arbitrarily say that uh, zero is is the electron in an outer orbital and one is the electron in the lower orbital. It's just a matter of convention. You do have a question, uh, Ilyan Chung. Uh, no, I, I have a question, but did you want to move forward with the presentation? 
Oh, go ahead with your question. Oh, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a question. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Francis. Does a wave-like perspective makes it easier to understand the energy amplitude are more noisy? I mean, when when you say that the energy is, um, um, I forget the term that, that that actually as the comments went on, but it's blurred. So if you look at at, at, at the atomic level, is it more um, which? A lot of the pictures actually show wave and wave amplitudes at maybe the specific energy amplitudes. Maybe it's blurring because actually there's more of a noise interference pattern rather than it being very clean and clear cut because of the entanglement. Um, in other words, sort of wave patterns are then becoming noisier. I'm not sure how to respond to basically that. more noise patterns. It's just an idea. There's another question. Can we detect superposition states of photons, transmons, NMR qubits, trapped ions? Absolutely, you can. When you perform a measurement, um, if you do a transformation first, you can map the superposition to a zero or a one, then you perform a measurement and uh, get information about which superposition you had before you perform the transformation. That's what I do in the Paris Merman circuit. And that's what's illustrated in all the IBM uh, training cases. Uh, they call it the measurement transformation. You perform a transformation and it, it takes the superposition and turns it into a zero or a one or a superposition of zero and one and you perform a measurement. So the answer is yes. Let's move on. So I'm gonna talk about classical error correction first because uh, that's what I need to look at in order to get an idea about quantum error correction. I lost my pointer. We can't oh, see. I'm, not, I'm not sharing the screen. That's the problem. So you look at all possible messages, and these could be classical messages. These could be like words or phrases and or sequences of characters. Now, some of them are valid messages like hello world where the words are spelled correctly. But if you flip a bit or if you insert uh, a character, it could turn the phrase into another phrase, which is not a valid message. So the basic idea of classical error correction is that um, you take the corrupted message, the one with the error in it, and you find what is the valid message that is most similar to the corrupted message and, and just convert it back to that valid message. So you'd be moving from here to here. And this is from the YouTube video, Three Blue, One Brown, which is a, a great resource. Great YouTube channel. Yeah. Yep. So to illustrate the power of classical error correction, take a compact disc and it has an image of the Mona Lisa say, but it's scratched. Well, if you read that, compact disk and, and extract the JPEG, extract the image file, bit for bit, it's going to be identical to what was written despite the corruption of all these bits. And this is accomplished by uh, classical error correction. So it's basically a case of 20 questions, right? Uh, 
there's a game children play. I'm thinking of something. I won't tell you what it is. You can ask me a question and I'll answer yes or no. Now with 20 questions, if they're well chosen, you can always determine what the unknown object was. So basically it's based on powers of two, two to the 20th power is a very high number. And so that's the key concept of classical error correction. And here's how it works. You have these, you partition, this is a message of 16 bits and you partition it four different ways. You have this, these bits and these bits versus these and these, these and these, or these and these, or these and these. And you look at parity, what is parity? Well, parity is the number of bits that are set modulo two. If the number of bits that are set is odd, the parity is one or odd. And if the number of bits that are set is even, then the parity is zero. So here I've given an example. Here's a message. And I simply toggle this bit here. This happens to be bit seven. Now the parity of this region here is encoded in this position right here. And let's see if I can get this right. These three bits have an even number of ones. So the parity is even. Now when I toggle bit seven, the parity is recorded in here for this partition. It's recorded here for this partition. It's recorded here for this partition. And it's recorded in position eight right here for this partition. So basically, you have seven uh, data bits and one redundant bit for the parity. So uh, I wrote a Python program and I executed this algorithm. I damaged the message, looked at which parities were no longer even. And I found that this one was still even. This one was still even. This one was still even. And this one was odd. So the intersection of the regions is this point here, which is bit seven. So basically, what this says is, by looking at these four parity bits, you can determine where the error occurred. And if you know where the error occurred, you can correct it by merely toggling the bit. Are there any questions or comments? Now we go to the quantum case. This is a quantum circuit. And this is, uh, if you wanna know about quantum circuits, I highly recommend IBM's Qiskit training series. They may not have the best qubits, but they have the best uh, teaching materials. They have the best learning resources, I think. Um, so this is a Hadamard gate. And this is a controlled not gate. So basically, if this qubit is zero, 
it doesn't change the second qubit. If this qubit is set, if it's one, it does change it, it flips it. If you have a superposition of zero and one, then you get a superposition of output states. So every quantum circuit has a corresponding matrix. If there are two qubits, it's a four by four matrix. Now, in a real circuit, and every quantum program, every calculation, every script is equivalent to a series of these gates. And the number of gates you have is the depth of the circuit. And it's the curse of quantum computing because when the circuit is deep, time goes on, you get decoherence. You exceed the, the, the coherence time and you have loss of information. But every quantum circuit, no matter how many qubits uh, there are, is represented by a, a matrix. And the dimension of the matrix is two to the n, where n is the number of qubits. And these matrices are unitary. And what that means is, if you take one column and you compute its inner product, its dot product, with another column, you get zero. If you compute its magnitude, its inner product with itself, you get one. So the columns are orthonormal and the rows are also orthonormal. And this basically is the universe of all possible quantum computations, at least on mainstream quantum computers. So every circuit is equivalent to a, uh, such a matrix. They're called unitary matrices. And I wrote some Python code to generate, I tried to generate a totally random uh, unitary matrix. I didn't succeed, I ran out of time. It is a valid unitary matrix, but as you can see, it, it's not uh, quite general. It has some zeros. So the key concept I want to bring home to you is that every quantum circuit, every quantum program, every quantum script is equivalent to a unitary matrix, which uh, has two to the n uh, rows and two to the n columns. Are there any questions or comments about this concept? And n being the number of qubits you have in the circuit, parallel qubits that you have in the circuit. Yes, Ron. Exactly. Uh, yeah, my, my only question here, Anna, is uh, that diagram uh, below of the quantum circuit, um, is that only for a transmon system? No. Like with a no, for trapped all. Trapped ions, the gate model applies to trapped iron. Uh, computers as well. Okay. Good question. I'm glad you asked. So what does this particular circuit do, the circuit that's equivalent to the matrix I showed you? Well, here's the Python program that generated the matrix. I have two quantum states, well, four quantum states. And I just hook them together. So I take the outer product of the first quantum state with the second quantum state. And what that does is that causes the matrix to transform the quantum state V1 in the quantum state V2. This is really easier to see with the Dirac notation uh, where this matrix would be represented as this bra and this cat. This line of code maps quantum state V2 to quantum state V1 like this. This one maps quantum state V3 to V4. This one maps quantum state V, I'm sorry, this one, yeah, and this one, this one, maps quantum state V4 to V3. And you just add them all together, you add the matrices together, 
and you get a unitary transformation, a quantum operation that will, if you give it V1, you'll get V2. If you give it V2, you'll get V1. If you get V3, you'll get V4. If you get if you give it V4, you'll get V3. Are there any questions or comments? Any questions about the code? The reason you can add them is that the operations don't overlap each other, right? Absolutely. Normally, you'd have to do a multiplication here, but it's uh, the there because one and two interact and three and four interact. The rest of the other elements in the matrix for each of those are zeros, so that's why you can add them and they'll work correctly. Specifically, each of these is orthogonal to each to the other three, and I accomplished that with this ninety degree uh, rotation right here. So now I've talked about these unitary matrices. They're, they're what quantum computing is all about. I mean, unless you're a hardware person, I guess. Uh, and uh, you have what's called a unitary uh, universal gate set. And the idea is that any computation, any program, any script can be written as a sequence of gate operations provided you have all the necessary gates, and you can do it with four gates, X, Y, Z, and C naught. That's the universal gate set. You can solve any problem theoretically by just uh, uh, chaining together these gate operations. And this is true even if you have more than two qubits. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, with X, Y, and Z, do you need to um, have a phase associated with each of those? Um, I think of X as complete rotation 180 degrees about the X axis, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about rotation about the X axis to a certain number of degrees, right? Um... I think you can do it. I'm pretty sure, Barry, that you can do it with just 180 degree rotations. I'm trying to. I'm. Oops. It's a little hard to see how that would work, but I, I, I believe that's I what I read. Okay. I mean, you can't do. Hmm. I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. Right, okay. I thought I read it was 180 degrees, but uh, uh, it does seem like it's rather hard to visualize yeah. how you could accomplish a 45 degree rotation uh, by building it up out of 180 degree rotations. That's kind of a mystery. Ken, do you know? I thought that one of them was parameterized, so you could set the angle in one and use the other two to tip the axis over and then rotate an arbitrary amount about one of the axes and then Great. go back. Um, so so like it's, it could be parameterized, but Y and Z could be 180. Or 90s. And that way you can rotate from one to the next. So, um, and, and so you can take whatever you wanted to rotate about and move it to the axis you can control and then move it back with the combination of the X, the one parameterized and two fixed. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I'm issuing here and now an open invitation to you to present to my meetup group because you've obviously done your homework. I'd have to polish a little bit more, Anna, but I, I, perhaps I will consider it. Thank you. So there's a subset of gates called the Clifford gate set. And uh, these three are Clifford gates. I'm not sure if this is all of them or not, but it's not a universal gate set. You can't build up any circuit with uh, a sequence of these. You need one more gate called a T gate, which I'll show you in a second. Clifford gates are very interesting. 
there's a mathematical group associated with it, the Clifford group. And uh, I believe I read that uh, if you have a quantum circuit that's constructed out of Clifford gates, you can simulate it efficiently on a classical computer. You don't have that exponential explosion of memory usage that you would get with the universal gate set. To make it universal, you need a T gate. And I have a diagram of the T gate. Here's a T gate. T is, I believe, one of these magic states that I don't know much about. But here's the T gate. You have a control knot. You have an S gate. Here's the matrix associated with a T gate. An error correction, as envisioned by the original paper by Peter Shore, uh, does not work for T gates. So therefore, you can't use Shore's uh, stabilizer codes to fully protect to fully protect a general quantum circuit. So well, here's a, a, a little bit of the history and state of the art. A year after he created his famous algorithm for breaking RSA encryption, he published a paper on stabilizer qubits. And he was basically working by analogy to these parity bits that I showed you a little while ago. It only works for Clifford Gates, not for the universal set. So therefore, they can't prevent errors in general circuit. Uh, in 2004, they came up with something called magic state distillation uh, for achieving universality, for, for dealing with the uh, deficiencies of the Clifford gate set. Here's what I found about my magic state dis distillation. Um, I don't really, I haven't mastered it yet. I'm going to present a, a follow on meetup in the Applied Physics Corporation meetup where I'll talk about magic states and finish out the story that I began tonight. And I'll post a link in the chat to that event. In fact, I'll do it right now. Bear with me a moment. Thank you for your patience. Here's what the, uh, basically I was working from this article in communications of, of the ACM. Uh, and here's what they said about magic state distillation. Control electronics use trial and error to construct these states until they pass tests. So that sounds like a classical process. One of the problems is that uh, you need to keep these states around for a little while before you use them for error correction. And uh, they may decohere before you, before you need them. So uh, they do provide universality, but there's a large hardware overhead. You have to generate a lot of them because you wanna make sure you still have some around when you need them. Production systems may need to employ many magic state factories. So here's what I have to say about the January ACM article. It's a great overview. It's acceptable, accessible to a non-specialist. I mean, you'll have to look a lot of stuff up, but uh, you won't hit a brick wall. Uh, the writer is not a researcher, he's a, he's a writer. Uh, I'm not sure why, but the error figures that are quoted in the article are too strict. 
he says that current qubits are accurate to one part in a thousand, and my experiments indicate more like one part in a hundred. Uh, he says that for a useful circuit, you need accuracy of one part in, in a quadrillion. I don't believe that. I think it's more like 100,000. And it talks about magic state distillation, which, as I say, will be a topic for another event. So that's all I have uh, to present tonight. I think we still have more time for questions, comments, and discussions, and I invite any of you to speak up at this point. Um, yeah, don't, I, I can just hop in real quick. Um, so I'm just looking at Clifford Gate and non Clifford Gate, and so. Clifford gates can be simulated on a classical computer efficiently. Yep. Um, and non Clifford gates cannot. And non Clifford gates is the T gate that we talked about on the slide before. Yep. So what? Why? So when would you use? And why would you use a non Clifford gate then? Well, you need a universal gate set. You write a quantum program, it has an equivalent unitary uh, matrix, an equivalent unitary transformation. And you can't, in general, synthesize uh, an arbitrary unitary transformation from a sequence of gates unless you include something like the T gate. Right. So in order for the quantum, uh, the... Uh... The circuit to be universal, you need to apply the non Clifford gate in a quantum computer situation. Yep. Okay. And, but that is something that classical computers cannot simulate as effect efficiently, effectively. That's right. And the reason is because, say, you have 30 qubits, then how much RAM do you need? You need, uh, I believe it would be a terabyte of RAM. So the biggest, I guess the biggest difference, also the biggest benefit between a classical and a quantum computer is the non-Clifford gates. Certainly sounds like it. I would conclude that from, from what we've seen tonight. I mean, that may be oversimplifying, but I think there's yeah. certainly a grain of truth to it. Okay, that's interesting. Was there any other questions? Yeah, it sorry. certainly feels like there should be a quantum advantage, uh, especially since the quantum computers, while they seem like they take up a lot of room, they tend to use very little energy because you're working so close to uh, absolute zero. Um, they also do things because they're they can the qubits can be in a superposition of states. They can be simultaneously in uh, evaluating many different possible answers. And the circuit eventually finds the ones that um, where either the phase um, matches up and you get a phase amplification, or there's another uh, way of solving a providing a solution. But it it's hard to quantify what the speed up would be. Um, we can then have things like large supercomputers, which are using an enormous amount of energy, simulate the same thing and produce an answer. It took a lot more time and a lot more energy to do what the quantum computer did easily and with relatively low amount of energy. But trying to identify what the actual advantage is or what the speed up would be is hard to do. Thank you. Right. So, um, in terms of right now, like classical computers, uh, the way the architecture is based off, like in terms of like classical computing, like they don't use the non clipper gate. So, like, there isn't like, is there like real, like any like code right now that is using these gates? Well, also like there's obviously the error correction and all that too. Um, and quantum computers just aren't accurate, but like nothing really is using these non clipper gates right now. I think some of the quantum uh, algorithms uh, probably require something equivalent to a non Clifford gate. Right. But the, but then the issue there is that 
the error the the error in the quantum system is the problem so like we don't really know like what uh Tam was saying like we don't really know like what like how effective or how efficient it is uh, I think you alluded to errors in the classical simulation. And if you just uh, have a naive classical simulation of a quantum algorithm, then of course there will be no noise, no decoherence, no errors. Yeah. However, uh, you may be able to get by with less RAM if you accept a certain amount of randomness. So I'm just, I'm just like trying to think like, um, like using like this level of like coding, like would this be like it's it's not like assembly, right? It would be like a little bit above that kind of. So like I'm just trying to think like like I'm just trying to imagine like how it would be different. Like how would it be different than like you know what I'm saying? Like like what what do you think like would be different? Like how do you think it would be different? I'm sorry, different in what situation? In terms of like how the calculation is processed. And then if you kind of just aggregate that, like how would that be shown differently on a, I, you know what I'm saying? Like right now, obviously it's just algorithms and obviously like it's able to speed out algorithms right now. I think that's the most common, but it's like, I don't know, like it's just like what, is the question more know. what is quantum computing? What is yeah, okay, never mind. So yeah. but my impression is that a quantum computer can evaluate a quantum computer is a machine to carefully hold and protect and manipulate qubits. And manipulation is both changing them, initializing them, uh, running the various gates, and then reading them back out. Um Ideally, you'd be able to read things out in the middle of a circuit. The IBM qubits can't do that. They say that they can, but that's kind of iffy. Um, well, if you try to compile it... Uh, I know, it it's, drags it, them all the way. It'll through. reject your circuit. I know, but but that's what a quantum computer does. So really, instead of calling it a quantum computer, we probably should call it like a quantum coprocessor. You'll be able to evaluate a quantum circuit there. But I think you're going to have a classical computer sitting next to it to take the problem and the data and transform it into quantum representation and compile it down to a quantum circuit, run the quantum circuit on the quantum computer, and then take the output of that and use the classical computer to retransform that back into a classical result. Because what the quantum computer does is you actually have a probabilistic system. You evaluate the circuit once and you get an answer. You evaluate it again, you get a different answer. And, and you evaluate it again, you get a different answer out of the possible states. So you have to build a histogram. And the idea is that the, the one bucket on the histogram that is the tallest would be the right answer, or the buckets that are tall are the right answers. So you have to run a circuit like 4,000 times to get one answer. So you see, it's a different way of doing things than writing a for loop. Uh, maybe maybe another example um, comes from uh, quantum image processing. Um, and this is all theory uh, and it's rife with uh, problems. But if you let's say you have a, a set of eight qubits or, you know, a qubit register of eight bits in theory, that eight bit qubit register can represent a uh, an image that's a single bit image that is eight by eight, which is uh, 64 bits. And, so, and in theory, you can do one operation on that register um, to affect, uh, to find patterns in that image, for example. Right. The well, I actually, the, the, trick, the trick to doing that is, though, is you have to, to get an actual image encoded into eight bit, eight qubits is not a trivial thing to do. So it's mostly theory right now. Well, but in actually the eight bits could evaluate two to the eighth. They're 256 states simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, exactly. Yeah. I, so it's not 64. Small. It's actually, so instead of 
the original eight bits, right, while yeah. they could hold a value, classical bits could hold a value from zero to 255. Yes. It, it could only be one of those at a time. While the Q, eight qubits are entangled and in the quantum and coherent, they can be evaluating the 256 states concurrently. But when right. we read it out, we only get one of those at a time. Right. And the, and the entanglement is not simple entanglement. To, to actually get an image encoded using that technique requires a whole lot of work and a whole lot of operations on those qubits to put them into some sort of state that sort of represents the image. You may not even be able to represent an exact image. Um, right. And but, that uh, takes time. Yeah. And that chews yeah. into your coherence time. Right. So that right. limits how long, the, how deep the circuit can be. And so but it's it hard could... to fit it all into, it's like, okay, I have to run my circuit in like one second or, and, or the bits evaporate or in, on the IBM systems, it's like a hundred yeah. microseconds. Yeah. And then, so then the question is, well, what, what is that useful for an image processing? Well, one, uh, some, most of the algorithms that I looked at were just basically it, you use the quantum quantum algorithms to either amplify or minimize errors in the image so that they're easier to detect with um, with uh, classical uh, techniques right but uh, again the, the real tricky part in most of the doc, most of the literature you run into they just sort of gloss over this is like okay how do i get that image encoded in there well the examples they give you would be some sort of geometric uh, image that's got a pattern to it it's like well that's not doing me any good if i want to put a picture of a cat in there how do i get a picture of a cat in there? <laughs> or get a you know if, and again you're 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 dealing with one bit depth images that are only one bit deep so it's basically black and white image and it's not just black and white it's no grayscale it's black or white image so uh but you still uh, get, getting those eight qubits into the proper state so that it represents that image is not trivial, at least from what I've seen. Correct. That, that and, transformation from the classical data to the quantum state and then from the quantum results back to the classical data is not obvious, and it's a, not a simple process. Yeah, and it's the same thing for any time you want to take a set of qubit red bits and call it a register, and then encode a matrix or a vector onto them. Same problems. Yep. To get to get an arbitrary vector, or arbitrary matrix encoded into those eight bit eight bits again. I mean, I'm sticking with eight bits. It's not a trivial process process unless it's it's a vector or a matrix has got a specific pattern. And then Agreed. it's like, what? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing that with? I quantum? mean, the whole fact that we're excited about eight bits, <laughs> eight yeah. qubits. <laughs> it's just like, I'm sorry, aren't we in 64 bit world now? And, yeah. and um, so it's, it's a different so, uh, type of, it's a different way of thinking about things and it's a yeah. different approach to these problems. It's a different way of, um, with mathematics, you know, you change the problem into one you can solve and then you change it back, hopefully getting an answer that applies to the original question. Or, yeah, or you the, go from the, one domain to another and back, yeah. Yeah, the yeah it's the same thing. Paper. Transform it to something that you can do and then put it back to what the person actually has. So the Strange Work paper addresses some of this. So basically, I think some of those issues are being resolved. It's just you're only getting good results with Quantum Simulator. And by that, I mean accuracy, and then it's slower than the classical. Um, but you know, other ones, there was a QC where, let's see, a uh, Roche paper, Im uh, medical image classification, Strangeworks and Rigetti have been working on pneumonia um, and say like retina. But yeah, that's that's the main thing is I think they're actually getting somewhere using the simulators. Um, at, but at this point, even using dynamic decoupling, you know, on the Rigetti's top of the line, ADQ, you know, that paper I, I put in there, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, not anything close to better. So I, I think that's what the whole, whole Dell ion Q, you know, this uh, emulator, um, that's what it's doing too. There's most of the results are coming from a simulator on classical hardware. Yeah. Hey, another comment uh, for Ken, uh, you talked about how operating qubits is very low energy. Um, I, get, I, I sort of had to chuckle because I was like, 
yeah, if you if you completely forget about all the energy it takes to chill those things down to milli kelvins, uh, yeah, it probably it probably doesn't. They probably don't need a lot of energy to actually operate. But no, there's almost zero energy to flip a qubit, whereas right. on a classical <laughs> machine, that is a lot. Yeah, it but does I, add up. But you're right. You have to cool it down. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, nobody nobody talks about that energy budget. So that's the problem is the faster we're running our classical computers, the dynamic energy consumption goes up with the higher yeah. clock rate. And so the energy to run, you know, it's like the Google and IBM disputing quantum advantage um, said, well, with you know, our supercomputer, we were able to do this. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but it's the size of a football field and it uses the energy takes, for a small city. And takes a 40 ton air handling unit to keep the more. room warm. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, well... So you look at the quantum computer and it seems like there should be an advantage. But again, we're excited about eight bits as compared to trillions of bits in a supercomputer available yeah. for computation. Oh, so it's kind of odd. It's different. It feels like there should be something really cool here. And we should be able to get it to go and really have it solve really cool, interesting problems. But it's more of a circuit evaluator and not a programming system. I and mean, they say they're complete. But uh, I think you're always going to have a classical computer sitting next to it to actually run it and coordinate what the quantum processor is, is doing. Yeah, everything I've seen has been hybrid. Um, right. There's been a couple of people that have come to Kevin's group uh, to discuss how they're using quantum, the quantum front end to uh, optimization problems before they feed it to their uh, machine learning back end. But in reality, you know, I, I, you know, they're talking about a four to six percent improvement, not not a not a magic huge improvement. Right, it's and, not yeah. that hundred thousand percent thing that we're hoping <laughs> to have. But but even if you have an important enough problem, a six percent advantage would be a big payoff. Well, yeah, that's and that's what this like the one group was. Uh, well, if they they were using their you know quantum and classical ML to uh, pick better routes for a trucking company in India, and right. if they could if they could get six percent better routes, that six percent better gas usage, if that company's spending a million dollars a day on gas, they're interested. Well, well, that bonus that six percent is a bonus for every worker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it really yeah. it's 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 the difference between profit profitable and not profitable. Um, yeah. perhaps uh, so but they're they're willing to spend the uh the budget on that sort of quantum uh resources or assets to get that six percent right. per i think i think optimis linear optimization problems where you have the potential for a huge uh, even a, an incremental improvement will provide a, tr a huge um practical improvement real result um i think um, simulating chemical systems, uh, chemical mo uh, mole molecular systems, which I think the D-wave system, the quantum annealers are probably best suited for. You set up the boundary condition, let it relax into the lowest energy state, and then you read it back out and it tells you how did the, the molecule arrange itself given the constraints that you put in. Yeah. Um, I think those two are probably the, the sweet spot. The the machine learning aspect is interesting, is very interesting too. And there's a lot of different things with a, there's a um, quantum variational eigen solver that IBM has, as it's also part of Qiskit. And you have to understand how to put the problem together. They have, have a problem that first you can write down as a set of linear um, equations. Do, uh, does that, does that efficient. algorithm rely on arbitrarily arbitrary phase rotation gates? Is that the one I don't believe that? so because you can implement it on the transmog. And okay. although they do have, you're right, they have the U uh, gate, so they can do arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it does to actually implement the, the variation. Um, and maybe that's part of it. I don't quite know. I, I, I haven't actually yes. run one of those. That was beyond... I only use the free machines, as quant as Anna alluded to. The free machines are crap <laughs> for trying to do real problems. Real, but yeah, 
but the but in looking at what's available um, as and I I can also say that IBM does have seems to have the best uh, training material available. It's the most consistent. It's not always a hundred percent complete, but it's really close and. Um, it's certainly worth looking at and then taking that knowledge and applying it where you can. Um, I'm excited about the continuum uh, machine as a possibility. Um, but the quantum mind. Pay for that, uh, uh, Ken. You yeah. can uh, uh, go to Azure and you can get a lot of uh, free time on their machine. I don't know how many qubits you get, though. My circuit only had like six or something. Okay. It'd be interesting to find out. I'm, I'm definitely going to take a look at that if I can. Uh, um, just so you, you, you mentioned- I see uh, quantum learning. In, uh, this is quantum transfer learning for image classifications at the paper you're talking about, uh, Kevin. Yeah, the other good one is the, it's a Los Alamos National Lab. Um, it's a yeah. nature paper. I think you need a subscription challenges and benefits of uh, quantum machine learning. And it kind of says like, you know, go towards supervise for this specific case, uh, a real good re uh, resource. Those challenges and what for machine learning? Challenges machine and learning? opportunities for uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, nature, if you have a, a subscription, if not, you know, it's harder to get. Well, institutional, I can, I, you know, through the library, I can get nature. So I can do that. I just have to look. Um, but you're right. It's better if you belong to an institution because nature is. Yeah. So going expensive. back to some of these previous comments, would it be about the same to do, say, for instance, image classification on qubits? on ion trap compared to uh, transmon or gate-based superconducting? I don't I don't know. Hopefully somebody else does. I've only looked, I've, I've, while I've looked at some of the other machines, all I worked on were the IBM transmon. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That paper, the first one I put in there, the it's uh, StrangeWorks and Deloitte. They use state-of-the-art Rigetti ADQs and then um, you know, versus classical versus simulator. And then they also used ADQ with dynamic decoupling and it didn't seem to help too much. So I thought that was the thing coming off from the IBM news that was going to make headways, you know, just chopping up circuits and running them on smaller quantum computers. But it, it, it may require more fine tuning. Um, they're planning on 16,000 plus modular qubits, I think using that technology. By the end of this year, and they're the 433 Osprey. Yep. Um, they were they're looking to be able to cluster those, and they've also come up with their um, Q2 for being able to uh, hexagonal packaging, so you can put three processors together and then provide some type of a quantum networking connection between three quantum processors, which will be very interesting to hear how that works with the no cloning um, theorem. Yeah, uh, and and how you actually transfer the state. Although what my understanding is, if you allow a little bit of an error, you can clone the state. It's just yeah. it's an imperfect I, I, copy. I see good news coming for gate-based superconducting qubits. So for those that don't know, there was a time cover, you know, on the magazine is solely a quantum computer for early February. And to me, the statements are, you know, what we hear before: perform something in seconds instead of thousands of years. Um, that says something as far as there's probably some good stuff coming out with that technology. Um, National Science Foundation says one of these technologies, I think they've had their hands on most of them, will produce a practical quantum computer this year. So it's just a matter of time. And if you're working on an application like my, myself, as you're trying to figure out, you know, which of these, and especially for medical, for FDA regulations, you know, has it run quantum programs before to begin with? You know, will it continue to get better? Is it a technology that isn't versatile with the other ones, the like standardization. I don't think it will replace the existing. Um, I think it will supplement. I think that uh, there is certainly for, we've come a huge way in uh, medical image classification, reading x-rays, the accuracy of the data available, um, both 2D and 3D information. Um, it's a huge, there's been such an enormous amount of work done since the 50s when CAT scans were first created, right? To, to get us to now where we have very serious diagnostic tools for imaging data available. Yeah. Um, Even for can, quantum, can quantum supplement that and improve um, patient results and improve, improve diagnostic results? It, there's a potential there, certainly, but 
what can we realistically expect it to do with our the noisy intermediate scale machines we've got, right? Yeah, I mean, there's so say for instance, Fermi Lab is a national lab, laboratory in the U.S. and they're building their own quantum computer and they're building on their own quantum sensors, which quantum sensors are technically MRIs, mm -hmm. so quantum sensors aren't new, but you know, right. diamond quantum sensing, MD centers, silicon vacancy centers, those types of things, uh, especially. And hearkening back to earlier, the Silicon Vacancy Center with uh, uh, Harvard saying that, you know, they use it for quantum communications, two seconds of, of uh, memory. Um, I don't know if it's considered QRAM, but figure that plus the other reports they do maybe being tied into quantum computers. And there's a huge paper. You have to check this out. It's Google, Caltech, Harvard. It's, uh, you know, using the original Google 2019 uh, quantum sycamore, and then it's using quantum sensing slash memory, and it's overcoming the noise from that uh, processor and mitigating it because the quantum effect due to the added sensing and memory is, is more significant and you're getting greater advantage than you did in October 19. Now, keep in mind, we haven't heard much from Google since then. You know, it's these QML updates, you know, but no mm -hmm. new hardware. So there's just so much that's pending. You know, we heard from IBM and I, yes. INQ, you know, that there's all these other companies. We heard a little bit from D-Wave a couple of weeks ago, you know, that we haven't heard from. So there's much to look forward to. There is. There is a tremendous promise here for... Uh, um controlling and understanding nature at a very delicate level and uh, gaining access to this hidden, uh, well, you don't want to use hidden variables because we know that that's not real, but there's, there's something going on in the quantum state when, when it's coherent and or entangled that allows you to evaluate many different possible solutions concurrently. And that yeah. seems to be where the that that quantum speed up could happen, an actual quadratic or exponential speed up could happen. There, there's a Chinese paper. It's almost 500 references, and it goes through one on one of the slides. It shows every single one of the error mitigation and error correction techniques, error mm -hmm. suppression that are they're being tried today. Um, if I find it, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, that would be very helpful. I would really like to see that. There are two things that excite me about quantum computing. One is the insight it'll provide into like what information really is, what really happens when you perform a measurement. So this is like metaphysics almost. And the other thing is that quantum computers can be used to understand uh, condensed matter physics and other physics problems. I think one of the first uh, really important applications of quantum computers will be um, to solve problems in physics. I agree. The, the molecular simulation, the, the atomic level system simulation, um, it, it's really difficult to know what's going on. Um, so far, the ones have, have required special, special uh, specifically built integrated circuits to actually solve specific problems. Like if you want to simulate five atoms and you have to construct X number of qubits arranged in a certain order on a particular chip. And I think with the trapped ion and the other machines available, we'll come up with more of a generalized way of doing that. Yeah. Even in the chemical world though, uh, molecular modeling is one thing. Uh, another thing that's going on in the, in the drug discovery area is they're using quantum algorithms to uh, pre-select molecules uh, based on a specific uh, search pattern, and then once they once the quantum algorithm identifies a molecule as being probable, then they just turn then they just take it and put it into their machine learning uh, algorithm to see to, to see if you know what the dynamics of it are for. Uh, drug discovery or uh, a drug that can affect a certain disease. Where and can I read what, about this, Ron? Uh, actually, uh, this is another one from Kevin's group, and I can't remember the guy's name or the lady's name, but um, uh, if you go to Kevin's uh, YouTube channel, I'm sure you could find the, the video yeah, so on that. It's Shahar Keenan. So with drug discovery, the big issue is that it's a relatively com computational 
intensive task. If you were looking right. at the whole protein and would try to simulate it inside the body with other molecules, we're talking like millions of qubits at least. So what they do is they just approximate and they'll flatten molecules, you know, from yeah. if you were to do chem draw, but they uh, flattened it into 2D. And then what, she, you know, Jahar and other companies does is basically you, they're working with, you know, big pharma and, and that sort. And, you know, uh, they say we have the specific need and then they say we can do that with quantum annealing. Um, so that's the whole thing is it's, it's mostly optimization. I haven't heard too much. I'd be interested if I and Trap has started to, to head that way, just because you'll see other nature papers for complex ta tasks. I don't think it's quite as error free as uh, as annealing. Um, but yeah, that whole industry is just, you know, there's many, many companies. And like I said, with myself, there's four or five, six of us, you know, in medical imaging and kind of hearkening back to those original, like, like an eight bit, you know, those types of things, like really small oh. images, black and white, um, you know, but a, a, a head start. But so, so basically, like, if you have a database of a billion molecules, obviously you don't want to run the entire database through your, your machine learning or inference machine. Yeah, and I, I think it's really so heavy. The, the, the quantum can pick better pick better candidates ahead right. of time. Right, and kind of what Ken had mentioned before, the quantum is, is maybe supplement to it all. Um, and I think the classical and the GPUs in specific, too, are a brunt of it. And the tasks that, you know, for quantum mechanics, it makes sense to do on a specific part with the, this quantum annual, or they'll do it that way. It's very interesting, all the different possible ways to do this and all the different possible technologies we have for qubits. Yeah, and keep in mind with a lot of these is just, it with say for instance, quantum convolutional neural networks, quantum neural networks is what they're calling it, is yes. that matrices, linear algebra, it seems to fit pretty hand in hand. And there's certain types, so they say it's it's more, it's less prone to the error, you know, that uh, more resilient to error than ever than other types of quantum programming. And that's why you don't hear about nearly as many different types of quantum programming as you do classically. Yes. Well, so, with, yeah, the classical like machine, <laughs> with the classical machine, you add two numbers, you expect to get the sum. Yeah, the and I, I think machine, even, even, even with Helen, <laughs> yeah, even with Helen before, she had somebody on about quantum error correction, and they have their circuits, you know, designed to, you know, uh, swapping and all these, you know, techniques to, to work around error. And I asked the question, I said, is this going to stand? Um, is this going to be built upon as quantum error is reduced? And she's like, no, it's different. We're just doing it these days because there's there's error. You know, like the circuits have to be designed that way. <laughs> yes. But there doesn't seem to be a clear winner in um, the quantum system. I think you're going to find different systems will be uh, applied for, to different types of problems and have a bet greater benefit for specific areas. We just don't quite know how all the pieces fit. Um, yeah, and if you talk to somebody at INQ and Quantinium, they'll tell you that, that you know, there these universal things like ticket at Quantinium is certain uh, aspects of the program are run on gate-based superconducting qubits, and then cer certain are run on gate-based ion trap. So they they do both. And um, I guess that's what you look for, for me, for applications for the future is number one, has there been significant programming? I think it's like 2 trillion or more uh, quantum circuits run on Qiskit so far. Yes. And, uh, you know, which will be improved, um, which has money, which has, you know, the most nature publications because it seems like it's working the best. Uh, so it's a variety of things. Great. Right. But we're still, it, but it is exciting. I mean, we've been doing this for 40 years. Um, and still, we don't have something where it's a clear cut winner on uh, a problem. Um, there's yeah, such I promise, mean, such promise from early papers. Yeah. And there's some shoe ins. I mean, to, to announce that you're going to make a quantum computing man manufacturing facility. And hence, they said it doesn't come out. This is INQ until uh, first half uh, next year. But that's a big step. And then yes. we have NSF saying practical quantum computer this year. We have Times, you know, quantum computer on the front cover. It, and by the way, it's, it, I think it was taken at IBM. 
So, and then you have these bold claims on time that, you know, not aren't necessarily true a hundred percent of the time. Um, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, you know, shooting for that. So. Right. Well, it's also, you have to, the, the, a small improvement in a quantum system isn't going to make the huge headlines. I mean, it might, but compared to how highly refined we are with the, the algorithms and ideas that we're implementing on classical machines, right? You have to have a, a clear advantage to say that, um, okay, this is the winner. This is the yeah. one that you should bet And again, on. I hark back to the ion trap being on, on Dell. You know, Dell has mm-hmm. that as part, part of their quantum solutions. Um, keep in mind, I don't think most of it is on the hardware. I think it's emulated. It, it, they right. haven't released the whole thing with that. That was last, what, October, November. But um, yeah, I mean, the government's done neutral atom. Um, I don't know if they've done spin qubit, but most of these start off as government projects and all these different organizations, especially NIST. NIST, NIST works like a lot of met- metrology and, and, you know, kind of like the the nuts and the bolts. Uh, they had this original quantum sensor back in 2009. They thought you could put on a tip of a rod and it would replace a, um, an MRI, a full body MRI, and you would go to patients and, and go scan. So I'm writing up a post right now and it's basically saying the same thing. I, quantum sensing plus quantum computing, this commensurative effect, and then quantum sensing has been around for a while. But in specific, the diamond-based, you know, nitrogen and silicon vacancy, kind of, uh, uh, it's fluorescence-based for those that don't know, um, but it picks up magnetic, electric, uh, temperature, uh, you know, these types of things. More versatile, it's a biocompatible, so they want to put it down, you know, patients' endoscopies and the other way too. So, Mm -hmm. and then you add that onto a quantum computer once we're up past eight bits, and then, you know, you know, exponential kind of uh, processing and parallel processing is I think a lot of people are looking forward to in, in many different fields. Right. And NIST has been playing around with quantum states for a long time, especially with um, atomic clocks. Um, they're very used to manipulating ions and systems at, at both low temperature and very stable quantum states yeah, for long durations well- even. The other big one is IEC and ISO. So IEC and ISO, they have a, a two quantum standards for uh, cybersecurity out right now. Now there's mm-hmm. a couple stages they passed, and then they're at it's called the emul um, the stage before approval, not yeah. emulated, but <laughs> the name is escaping me. So they have two of these, and it's going to pave the way, in my view, for other types of uh, quantum standards and other areas. But right now. The number one pressing thing in the government's eye with the law, you know, it's a law for federal agencies to do cybersecurity is just that, um, you know, implement these NIST algorithms. And then right. post, um, post quantum cryptography. Yes. Right. Because people have to understand quantum. They have to like fund quantum. And after they start to do those two, you know, they'll start to say, oh, you know, medical or transportation or, or mm-hmm. finance. Agreed. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm sorry, I kind of, I don't know if I capitalized on things too much, but uh, it certainly was interesting. I'm looking forward to your next talk, Anna, because um, I, I always like to see where things are going and the fact that you just learned something the day before you did the talk, and that's the next <laughs> talk that we're going to do. And it's like, okay, cool, something to look forward to. Well, Ken, I'll try to stay ahead of you. I think it's going to be challenging. Uh, I think there are two questions. Can you tell a little bit more about our uh, magic states? Are these states maximally entangled states? All I can say about magic states is that I'm going to explain it in the future. And uh, here's a link to the event. And uh, the other question is, um, are the quantum computers better protected from cyber attacks than the classical computers? Well, the present day quantum, that's a good, interesting question. The the present day quantum computers are totally immune to the internet because uh, there's no network interface card that uh, provides input to them. In the future, 
I think it's an open question how you connect a quantum computer to the internet. Ultimately, hopefully, we'll have a quantum internet where your quantum state will be transmitted uh, over the network. And at that point, I think security would be a big issue. Cool. Yeah, um, if you, can, you can defend conventionally. So these PQC algorithms, you don't necessarily have to defend with a quantum computer. So you they would attack internationally, you know, and then that's just how it is. You can, you don't have to have a quantum computer. Exactly. Well, I mean, there is quantum-based communication where you can detect any tampering or eavesdropping. Yeah. And that's being used now. Mm -hmm. um, in Europe, I don't know about it, the United States. Nobody's been talking about it. I figured it's probably too, too secret. But there is a, a well, link. There's a Wikipedia article that like tells you what corporations are selling the service. Okay. I, I, I listened to an IEEE talk on quantum communications, and the whole point is by constructing those entangled states, you can detect if anyone has eavesdropped or modified the message as it's transmitted through a fiber optic network. Yep. And that lets that both that people know, um, both the transmitter and the receiver can tell that things have been tampered with, which is really quite intriguing. Yeah, I... I attended a, a seminar on uh, the U.S.-based uh, communication companies that are scrambling to get um, some sort of standard for quantum mm -hmm. photonic fiber-based mm -hmm. thingies, and they can't even agree on what you know. They can't even agree on what a what a, a standard what they call a, a customer pre premise entry point would be because they all have different technology, right. every, every single one of them. It's and, too tied to how you build the quantum state at the moment. Yeah. And they, uh, you know, but, the, you know, they're, they're getting the stuff, they're getting the wheels turning. So, but there are companies, to my understanding, in the United States that are selling quantum key distribution. Okay. Uh, on short, for, they've got to be like short haul uh, fiber networks. Could be. But um, I, I would assume so. Actually, if you just use the quantum keys, then whatever you send in the middle is encrypted uh, with those keys. So that's the idea. Yeah, and there's a, there's a bunch of smaller networks. So you have Argon and, and uh, Fermilab that are doing classical and quantum data at the same time. You have other networks. I think the hard part is a true quantum internet. And the easier mm -hmm. part is they call it entang entangled network. So it's right. just like, like that in between to get before we get better. Well, right. the bottleneck is quantum repeaters. I mean, a photon might survive 100 kilometers in a high quality fiber optic cable, but it's not gonna go 1,000. And uh, uh, so you need a repeater and the repeater technology require Bell State analyzers, which are like a laboratory uh, contrivance and uh, you need those repeaters, and I don't know how long it's going to take before we see them. Yeah, and they're they're so mixed. You know, was, I saw a Verizon one. It was a QEDC, and everybody's just asking for Verizon's attention on this. But basically, there's you know both classical and quantum ca counterparts and sensing and computing all al along is what we say as a quantum internet. It's never, I don't think it's going to be like that. It's always going to be hybrid. Yeah, you know, there was a presentation in this group, Washington DC group, a couple months back, uh, a gentleman presented on what China was doing with their, their quantum uh, it, network where it's satellite based and basically the job, the satellite's not really involved with the communications. It's just, an, its job is to create the uh, pair of entangled photons and shoot them at different locations. And then uh, uh, these two different locations now have one half of the entangled pair and then they can do certain kinds of communications. But even, even that, was talking about they got to send a million photons to get one 
or something like that, a million photons to get one viable pair. Yeah. Um, so that that to me that sounds like well that's that's going to be that's going to be quant you know key distribution. I mean you're going to go through all that work and you it's going to be very difficult to actually send messages of size, but you know the benefit of a quantum key distribution is pretty good. So it might just be good enough for the I mean for yeah. that. With this Verizon gentleman, he showed kind of like, you know, things go wrong. Like even in New York City, there's a backhoe that backs up into it. And you have sure. limited, defi you know, defined spaces that people can't, in, can't get in. But keep in mind, the framework, as far as I know, for fiber work has been laid as opposed to the first time we got high-speed internet. Um, so I think that's an advantage, you know, with quantum that it, it can, it passes data that way. Yeah, pretty much all the uh, high bandwidth uh, classical networks are, uh, you know, the highest grade of fiber. Yeah, and as far as that, how that, long it take to get established. Yeah, and when you supposedly uh, you would be able to shoot entangled photons down the same the same fiber. Another option is to bounce them off satellites. Yeah, that's what I was talking. Well, no, they don't bounce. You don't bounce them off the satellite. The satellite is the originator of the pair. No, but you could send a, a quantum a photon to a satellite. The satellite could uh, uh, conceivably function as a repeater and uh, send it back down to to the destination. I yeah, but any, if you got to send a, a million copies fiber. of the message, it's right now you have to send a million copies of the message to get viability. I think and, and terrestrial fiber works really well. Yeah, I mean, like, it just doesn't seem practical that they were saying they were internationally getting better results, sending it to outer space and back, or to a satellite, not quite outer space, as opposed to terrestrially. Is that is that the case? Has there been an update with that? Well, the attenuation of a photon going to low Earth orbit is, is not that great. I mean, I, I think the attenuation is considerably less than fiber optic if, if I looked at it, if I remember what I saw when I looked at it. Yeah, it depends on the laser frequency more than anything. Well, yeah, you've got to avoid but, uh, like the uh, absorption lines of, of water and yeah. oxide, <laughs> stuff like that. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, yeah. But it, but again, it seems like they're going through a lot of work, and it's like, well, if you can get that to if you get that to be a viable system for moving keys around. Once you have the keys move around, then you can use the keys for classical networking. And assuming that at some point in the future you can get the the speed at which you can distribute those keys up, you can you can be changing the keys in out of band quantum channels many times an hour or many times a minute even, and uh, you know get added security that way. Yeah, because I think the biggest challenge terrestrially is urban areas, because both DC QNet, which is in Washington, D.C., and then the Fermilab in Argonne is that they're both, you know, under buildings, you know, those types of things, you know, these challenging areas. Um, yeah. Well, here in the Chicago area, we also have the benefit of uh, the Bell, Bell Labs here in Naperville, where I spent three years. Uh, was the home base for the uh, uh, for a lot of the metro telephony switching products, and a lot of the. I don't know if it was the fiber research happened there, but the fiber communication research happened there. So, all your all your metro switches are connected uh, these days via fiber switches or f fiber cable bundles. I've got to take off. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to end it right there. It's 9.30. Uh, yeah, this meetup was till 9.30. Uh, Anna, once again, thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for hosting the meetup today. Uh, thanks for discussing. Uh, it was a really good discussion. Ron, Ken, Kevin. Um, well, it's really great to be have. part of this community. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, that was chill. Um, yeah, honestly, it's 9.30 on Sunday. We got work on Monday uh, for everyone else. So. Get some bed. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, have a great night for everybody.
Um, ch check your uh, Washington uh, Quantum Group uh, uh, meetup site or whatever, wherever you got this information. I will be doing the uh, Quantum Tools Chain in two weeks from our two weeks minus a day from now. So yeah. should, all that information should be out there. Uh, That's good. Right. So yeah, guys, catch Ron in two weeks. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.